we are going to look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. Are you all with me? Amen. This is the first message in 2015. And the title will be Reaching God's Goal in 2015. Reaching God's Goal in 2015. And we're going to begin reading. Um, I have, I brought a different Bible today. It's not the New International. Uh, so the reading is going to sound a little bit different than what you have, but uh, it's just a little bit amplified. That's why they call it the amplified uh, translation. Okay, so follow as close as you can. Beginning with verse 12, Philippians chapter 3. Verses 12 through 16. Not that I have now attained this ideal or have already been made perfect, but I press on to lay hold of or grasp and make my own that for which Christ Jesus, the Messiah, has laid hold of me and made me his own. I do not consider, brothers, that I have captured and made it my own yet. But one thing I do, it is my one aspiration, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the supreme and heavenly prize to which God in Christ Jesus is calling us upward. So let those of us who are spiritually mature and full grown have this mind and hold these convictions. And if any and if in any respect you have a different attitude of mind, God will make that clear to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have already attained and walk and order our lives by that. Amen? Reaching God's goal in 2015. Are you interested in falling in line with God's plan for you? Will, will you write, like to reach the goal that God set for you or do you like to reach the goal that you set for yourself? If you would like to reach God's goal, listen to this. You cannot reach God's goal until you do it by his owner's manual. And that's the Bible. This is the goal that God has set for you. It's written. It's, there are no ifs and buts about it. It's, re it's plain. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It's written in that language. If you speak French, it's in it. If you speak English, it's in it. If you speak Ebonics, it's in it too. And if you, if you speak Southern, it's in Southern. Ask me, I'll tell you where to get them. 
But I just want to focus you right now. I want us to focus on Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. This is what is going to put it together for us. If you look in your Bible, the title in your Bible is Pressing on Toward the Goal. Right? Pressing on toward the goal. So, how do we do this? And Paul here, when he was writing, was probably looking forward to go to a sports event. And was remembering, remembering the athletes that he saw in his time. And he used the analogy and the language in this passage. And it is very clear that he wants us to think of a runner. So, let's look at the principles that are going to guide us. As the people of God. So again. Let me, let me. Make this very clear. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ. As your Lord and Savior. And committed to him. As your Lord and Savior. I'm probably not speaking to you. Because it would be impossible. For you to follow this principle. You cannot do them on your own. They can only be accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit. And God does not force anybody to do things his way. God is so loving. And so kind. That he won't force you against your will. You probably have heard me say this several times. If you want to go to hell, he will let you. That's your choice. That's why he made us free beings. But if you have accepted him as Lord and Savior, Lord means my master, my boss, my king, my priest, my Savior, my all in all. If he is all that to you, then you cannot disobey the manual that he made for you. He's your owner, right? If you're driving a car, you have an owner's manual. If you have a problem, you go in there. You're seeing a light, you don't understand what it says. You go in the owner's manual. God has one for you, right here. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. If you want to be successful in 2015, this is my advice to you. Based on Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16, the first thing you need to do is forget the past. Paul started in verses 12 and 13. He said, not that I have attained this deal. In other words, I'm not perfect. I have not taken everything. I have not grasped everything. I am not all that God wants me to do, wants me to be. I am not there yet. I have done nothing to make me perfect. But I press on to lay hold of the graphs and make my own that for which Christ Jesus, the Messiah, has held hold of me and made me his own. Once he made me his own, my commitment is now to him. 
And so he is telling you, if you are my child, if you are my follower, if you are my disciple, this is the way you're going to be successful in 2015. Forget the past. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Forget them. Some of us just have too much stubbornness in us that we don't like to give up the past. I know, I know, I know. Some of you psychologists are probably looking at me. Well, but you're supposed to go deep into your past. And, and, and realize why you are who you are. And what has affected you. And, and, and some, sometimes I think of all these great PhD psychologists. Who are trying to dip in and, and find out who you are. And I'm saying, what if all you discover is you're just like an onion? Amen. Keep peeling it off. Finding out who you are with all that cry and everything. And then you go deep there and say, it's still an onion. <laughs> Some people are for years trying to discover themselves. And there are a lot of people that have misused our system by talking about, yeah, I'm a murderer because of my mother locked me up in the closet. I tell you, I, I should have been a real criminal if it's based on how your mother treated you. She was lucky she was in Nigeria. <laughs> if she was in the U.S., I would have reported to the... <laughs> but you know what? I'm glad... She did what she did. Amen. Because you cannot allow your past to define who you are. You are more than your past. You can look back and see how good you were and what things you accomplished and, and feel really Better than you should be feeling. Because of your past. You can look at your past and saw how many jails you've slept in. And, and, and how many police officers have stopped you. And all those. And allow that to control your life. And you will be miserable for the rest of your life. And in fact, I'm, I, you know, I may as well use David and I may as well use Shalina who came up today and said, yes, I have been in this place, but here is where I am today. The point is your past can be dangerous if you allow your past to guide you and to rule you and to control you. If you're going to be successful in 2015, forget the past. How many of you here feel it is a really, really good thing to drive by looking at your rear view mirror? Amen. I, I tried to do it today coming here. <laughs> Glad I was alone in the car. Because you see, my kids, they were really funny. 
they used to be so quiet. There's a lot of things I used to do. And now they come out, they say, little by little of it. They used to be in the car with me. The car would be burning hot. Judge said, we couldn't say anything, so we pressed our faces on the... <laughs> I said, why did you guys say you were hot? Because we knew you were cold. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot drive your car that's why they make the windshield you have to look where you're going not where you came from unless the police is after you That is the way we go through life. You don't go through life by looking at the rear view mirror. And you cannot be spiritually fed and seeking God's will by allowing your accomplishments and your failures of the past to hold you down. If you do that, don't ever let me hear you sing Jesus paid it all. If you paid it all, why you spend all your time looking in the past? And since Paul was talking and was using a lot of athletic terminologies and and uh, I, I will explain them as we get to them. But this one he's talking about is about a race. Someone who is getting ready to run a race. You don't run a race by looking at the people who are behind you. The more you turn, the more time you lose. Amen. Uh, you know, uh, Richard Hairston one time uh, tested me here at Village Baptist. Said, this short pastor, I can outrun you. I said, really? I was a little bit younger then. He said, I'll, I'll race you. I said, you really? I said, let me give you my resume. <laughs> I said I was so fast I was in my high school I was the second fastest person in the whole school I was on the relay team he said I don't care I said, I've played soccer all my life. I represented all Western Nigerian soccer team. He said, really? I said, yeah. He said, but I still want to race you. I said, okay. I don't know who called it then. I can't remember. Was anyone here that was there? Okay. I said, okay, let's call it. And go, all of a sudden, I was looking back, and he was still back there. <laughs> but if the distance was long enough, the more I look back, the more he will catch up to me. Problems catch up to you when you look back. That's why 
Trainers will tell you your eyes should be on the prize. You should be aiming for the goal. And the goal that we have, it's already accomplished and it's already guaranteed that it's going to be given to us. It doesn't matter. Just run the race that is set before you. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Simply stated, I, I, I'm going to move on. Simply stated, all, all, all I'm saying to you today is, God is saying it doesn't matter what's in your past. Even the good stuff, don't let them fool you. Just look to the future. The second thing that you need to do is simple look to the future. And the looking to the future must be intentional. Look at verse 13. I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured and made it my own, yet... But one thing I do, it is my what? One aspiration. I forget what lies behind and I do what? I strain forward to what lies ahead. Amen. I, I want you to get it. I'm not going to tell you the Greek and the construction and everything. But the point you need to get here, strain means you need to work on it. It has to be intentional. I strain forward. This is how a true athlete prepares for a, for a race. Yes, Alan Iverson, it's practice. <laughs> we have someone here who... I would say was himself an athlete. I'm not sure if I should say is an athlete because you still have to train them. But no pain, no gain. Amen. Are you listening? This is what God is telling you in 2015. Straining toward what is ahead means you've got to work on it. If you're going to be spiritually successful in 2015, you have to practice. You cannot look forward to the coming of Christ by worshiping with the devil. You have to prepare for it. You have to prepare. You have to be constantly aware of the guest that you're going to meet. You have to be constantly prepared for the one that you're going to meet. You have to prepare for yourself for the competition. I'm telling you today, if Village Baptist Church if we members, if we who call ourselves Christians are going to be successful in 2015, we cannot just do it when we want. Are you understanding me? Athletes do a lot of things to get prepared for their competition. Amen. It includes dieting. There's some things you can't eat. If you prepare, it includes weightlifting. Amen. I've often wondered about it. I went, uh, because the way I was raised in Nigeria, we didn't have all this equipment. We don't have all these things in the gym and everything. You want to run a race, you practice to run a race. Amen. You don't do no bicycling. You don't do any weightlifting. You don't do anything. We don't have all those. That's why we were not that good. <laughs> I 
I mean, just plays basketball. If you see his training, you think he's crazy. You have a big old tire that weighs about 200 pounds. He's running it and driving it down the field and back and forth and then he's doing some rope things and say, what's that got to do with basketball? <laughs> he's doing running from side to side and everything. And I said, this is crazy. And a lot of the Nigerian athletes agreed with me when I took Jeremy to Africa to train athletes. Some of you were there. They said, why do we have to do that? I said, because I want the whole of you to be prepared for the competition. The whole of you to be prepared for the competition. Some of you want to teach Sunday school and you don't study the Bible. You don't go to prayer meeting. And you think you're qualified to teach the Bible. It's going to be an all around thing. Amen. You don't fast. In fact, you don't even come to church every Sunday. Amen. And, and let me tell you, some pastors and some churches are the ones who are destroying Christianity. You know, some people want to sing in the choir. And they get people to, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> they get people to sing in the choir who the first time they showed up, the people, they just want a body. You have a voice, sing. And many times they have people singing in the choir. They have people being deacons in the church who made the front page of the newspaper and they said, we didn't know that because you're idiots. To lead in praise team here does not require just your voice. Amen. Praise the Lord. You need some spiritual practice. Well, the coach doesn't play me that much. I'm good. I can jump better than everybody. You don't practice well. Yeah, it's about practice. It's about spiritual practice. By the way, I'm teaching how to study the Bible for Golden Gate Seminary this semester. And you can apply for it. Golden Gate Seminary, apply for it if if you want to learn how to study the Bible, I'm not, you know, I'm talking about real serious study of the Bible. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you know, some of us, hello. <laughs> some some of us, some of us need to lose some spiritual fat. Yeah. I went to my doctor. I got on the scale. And I told him I was thick boomed. <laughs> he looked at me and said, No, Reverend, you're obese. So don't bring me any more rice. I've cut down on rice and everything. You know, if, if you want to 
survive spiritually, there are some things you need to cut out of your life. Amen. You can't be at church on Sunday, partying all night on, 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 on Saturday. Amen. Nobody, you know, you're not even different from the people in the streets. Amen. You can't say, I'm in Christ. You still lie like the people out there. Cut it out. And some TV shows you need to cut out. Amen. Amen. Ask yourself, how is this adding to my holiness before God? Those of you who watch those uh, food shows, you're going to be selling food for the Lord? <laughs> if you're not, spend more time in the Bible. Let me, let me move on. to strain for it. If you're not straining for it, you are not doing anything. Amen. Amen. When you come to Bible study when you want to, you come to Sunday school when you want to, you come to church when you want to, you want to do things when you want to, you are not a straining Christian. You give the only tithes that doesn't affect you, it's really amazing. Some people say, I can't pay my tax. God, go pay my bill. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. We just want it easy. Jesus didn't have it easy. The easy thing was to basically just say, not just uh, whatever your will. No, take this cup away from me. I don't want it. I don't want it. Some of us think when we come to church two or three times, we've done God a favor. I, it's really interesting. I was talking to someone a long time ago. Uh, they accepted Christ and I went to talk to them. The first thing they told me about is, what can I do for the church? I said, you're still a baby. You can do nothing for the church. You need to grow first. Let the church do things for you right now. We are Sunday school. We'll do things for you. Come there. We are Bible study. We'll do things for you. Come there. When you're grown, you can do something. You, don't, you are crazy if you want a baby to start playing football. Amen. Oh. Everybody has him. It's amazing. How, what will you think I am if I tell you Noah is preaching this morning? <laughs> Probably ask for to give you my doctor's number. Number three. You have to live in the present. Again, verse 14. Look at verse 14. I press on, and that is in the present tense, which means it is a repeated action in the present. I press on toward the goal to win the supreme and heavenly prize to which God in Christ Jesus is calling us upward. So you have to do it in the present. Press on. Holiness and spiritual vitality are lived in the present. True spirituality is work. Reading the Bible regularly is work. If you don't think it's work, I know you are not reading. It's work. Because anytime you start doing the right thing, the devil wants to make it difficult for you. 
If you're not trying to do the right thing, he doesn't care. He already has you. Attending Bible study now, it's work. Worshiping God and consistently doing it is work. Spiritual ministry is work. Be a serious Christian. People know it when you're not serious. You're not fooling anybody. They just don't want to tell you. They all know they just don't want to tell you. You come for a few Sundays and then you take off. You don't even allow yourself. You know, we have school. We have, we have Sunday school. If Sunday is too early for you, we have it Wednesday night. It, it's amazing. Stop blaming everybody else for your spiritual immaturity. Amen. For your spiritual laziness. Amen. It's amazing people. I, I stopped going there because nobody cared about me. I was sick, nobody called me. Who did you call? Oh, Village Baptist, they must have a spiritual osmosical uh, sense of knowing when people are sick and people are in need of help. The Bible says, if, if you're in the fellowship and you need it, you should ask. That's what fellowship is. <laughs> I stopped reading my Bible. I stopped going to cell group. Uh... Because I stop praying every day because I don't meditate anymore because I don't worship with all the gusto that God has given me because lose you all of your becauses. They are not legitimate. Amen. I'm not even going to tell you. I'm going to ask you to tell me what your because is. It's not legitimate. They are legitimate to you only because you're selfish. If you want to be successful in 2015, cross out all of the becauses. Like my doctor said, they make you spiritually obese. And sometimes when you're obese, people think, oh, your cheek shows you have money. You're eating well. But your heart is saying, I can't pump. You know, it's, it's amazing. When you, you, when you really overweight and you're doing the wrong things, it's amazing how climbing 10 steps become a major duty. And you have to climb up. I go every month to uh, our uh, financial manager and they have elevator or anything, but no, I, I have to go through the stairs. And there are about a hundred of them. And I get up there and I get and say, I don't know why I do this. That's the elevator. And I get there and I say, hey, yeah, I've, I've, I've done it today. Do 
The reason why you don't study the Bible the way you should be studying or pray the way you should be praying or go to Sunday school the way you should be going or study your Bible or, or be there to praise God the way you should is because you have allowed some spiritual fat in your life. Fight is ain't good anyway. I know some, some say, oh, you got to have some fat. When it's showing, it's no good. <laughs> Amen. You can be all philosophical about it. Everybody knows you don't do this anymore, but you're still thinking you're okay. In psychology, they call it transactional analysis. Everybody thinking everybody is okay. Anyway, let me leave that alone. The last point is this. If you want to be successful, live like a mature Christian. Let's look at verse 16. Verse 16 says, only let us be true to what we have already attained and walk and order our lives by that. But if you look at verse 15, that's the reason why verse 16 is there. It's because of verse uh, 15. So let those of us who are spiritually mature and full grown have this mind and hold these convictions. And if in any respect, you have a different attitude of mind. God will make that clear to you also. Unfortunately, some people want to be baby Christians all their lives. Unfortunately, that's true. I've had experiences in the church. And this is not the only church I've pastored. Where you have people who just come in a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, and they're already teaching Sunday school. And you have people who've been there for 40 years. They still don't know the books of the Bible. Different attitudes. And Paul, it is not new. Paul has met so many of them in his ministry. In fact, one time he called, he said, some of them are carnal. And he said, don't ever be surprised when you meet people in the congregation of other churches who are spiritually immature. They're 40 years old, but they live like they're two years old. Because they have not developed spiritually. Amen. Now I know you, you can get mad at me if you want. I'm preaching the word. I'm preaching the word. You have people who have been in the church for 50 years. Don't even know what tithing is. They've been giving their $5 a week for the last 50 years. Like all the church need is $5 foot long. Uh. <laughs> and and there, are, there are ways in which these people have lived their lives. Don't confuse me with the Bible. I already made up my mind. See people who come to church every day. They're nice people. And they're going out with a non-Christian. And not only are they going out with a non-Christian, they're shacking up with them.
Why will you want to do that? That's intentional. You can say, oh, it just happened. <laughs> it's intentional. Please get mad at me. I'm just a mailman. I'm delivering the mail for God. Seek your dog on me. Amen. You say you're a Christian. You're dating on the internet. You don't even know if this person is a Christian. I don't care if you went to the Christian website. Everybody in America is Christian. Don't you know that? And then you get yourself in trouble. You want God to take you out. Get you out of it. I didn't put you in that. Get yourself out. <laughs> now Paul is very careful here. And in other places he said, we are fighting. We are in a fight. We are in a race. You've got to be prepared. Don't worry when people in the church violently go against the will of God. You're not to defend God. God can defend himself. And if you stand for the truth, you stay with the truth. Let God be true and every man a liar. Paul said, I have been in this ministry. At, at the time that Paul was writing this, he was already in the ministry for 25 years. Some of those years he spent in prison. But he said, I know some people still going to disagree with this. But God is going to let you know. Some people love what they feel more than what God feels. But I don't feel that way. And I don't care. This is what the Bible says. Either you're with God or you're not with him. It's true discipleship. Don't get me wrong. There's a place for all of us to grow. We are all growing. But you can't grow by telling the dietitian that you don't want to eat what he's suggesting is going to be the best food for you. So, as I close, I want you to help me with this. I want to say something, and then I want you to tell me it's maturity or immaturity. Okay, so we're going to all say it together. Don't worry if you're in the minority. Okay? It's not being graded. It's not, you know, uh, because true maturity is discipleship. True cross-bearing is maturity. Now, I want to start it now. Living by the Bible and not just how you feel is? Thank you. Doing it because everybody is doing it is? Thank you. Thinking Bible study is a matter of choice is? Thinking prayer and worship time is a matter of choice is? Thinking and believing you don't have to tithe is? <laughs> believing you only do what comes easy and convenient for you is? Thinking that coming to church makes you a Christian is? God bless you. Amen. Let us pray.